Morning, church. We will be reading from Titus chapter 1, verses 5 to 16, which is on page 998 in your Pew Bibles. Page 998. This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife, and his children are believers, and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered, or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but both their minds and their consciences are defiled. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. This is the word of the Lord. Uh, morning again, church. It's a joy for us to look at uh, the passage that was just read in the book of uh, Titus. I should say I had no role in the the. Uh, production of that video, um, but it was, it, was, it was good to see. Um, but we're going to look at the words that were just shared, Titus 1, uh, verse 5 to 16, to see what God has to say to us, and in order to do that, we need God's help, and so let's turn to God now in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the gift it is and the treasure it is. Lord, we take for granted your word all the time. Uh, we take it for granted that in the words we read here, you, the almighty God, have spoken and are speak you are speaking. Lord, I pray that you would give us such a desire to hear just even one word from you. Lord, open our eyes to see what a glorious thing it is that you have spoken to us. And you have spoken to us, Lord, because you love us. So, Lord, help us to hear your word. Lord, the, the Bible is full of example of, after example of people hearing your word and disregarding it. Lord, we know left to ourselves that will be true of us as well. But, Lord, help us. We don't want to be those who hear your word and then go, go away disregarding what you have to say to us. You are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Lord, help us to have the right reverence for your word and the right diligence and zeal to do what you are calling us to do. Help us, Lord. Have mercy on us, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. It's often said that the first step, the first step is to recognize that you have a problem. Uh, the first step is to recognize you have a problem. Uh, I'm sure a number of us have heard that. Um, there's something going on. There's a situation. And sometimes... You're oblivious to it. You're oblivious that there's an issue. You're oblivious that there's a problem. And so someone might say to you, the first step is to recognize that you have a problem. If you're going to get help, um, if you're going to find a solution, you first have to identify the problem. Right? There's no point looking for the solution if you don't know what the right problem is. That's the first step. You, you have to understand what the problem is. But it's not okay to just understand what the problem is. You then have to find the right solution for the problem. Sometimes you know what the issue is, 
but you, can't, you don't know how to solve it, right? So the first step is you need to get the right problem, and then the next step is you need to get the right solution. And I say that because in our text this morning, in Titus chapter 1, there is a problem. There's a problem facing the churches in Crete, where Titus was, and it's the same problem that faces us. It's the same threat that faces us. So if you look with me at verse 5, the very first verse of our reading, Paul is speaking to Titus, Titus is in Crete, he says, Paul says, this is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order. So the situation is that Paul was with Titus in this place called Crete. Paul loves Titus, right? We saw this last week, Titus is his true child. Paul loves to be with Titus. You see this throughout Paul's letters, how much Paul loves being with Titus. And yet Paul says, first verse says, Paul says, this is why I left you in Crete. Paul separates from Titus. Why? Paul says, in order to put in order what remained. In other words, to fix something that is lacking. There is a problem, Titus, and I need you to stay there to bring about the solution. It's quite a striking thing. Paul, the great apostle, had been in Crete. He had been in this church. We don't know how long he had been there, but Paul had been there. He had been teaching. He had been doing ministry. And yet when Paul leaves, he says, there's still a problem here. There's still a big issue here. And it's such an issue that I'm going to leave you, Titus, to fix this. And so Paul leaves Titus in Crete. And he doesn't just leave him saying there's a problem. He tells him what the problem is, and he gives him the solution. And that's really helpful for us because, again, the problem that faced the churches in Crete is the same problem that faces us. And so the solution that Paul gives for Titus to, to give to the churches in Crete is the same solution that we need. And so very simply, what we're going to look at is we're going to spend the first half looking at what the problem is, and then we're going to spend the second half looking at what the solution is. But we're going to do it a bit weirdly. We're going to work backwards in our text. We're going to actually start at the end of our text, and we're going to work our way to the beginning of our text, because the text ends with the problem. So we're going to start with the problem, which is right at the end of the text, and then we're going to work our way back up to the solution, which is at the beginning of our text. And my prayer is that as we do this, we would recognize the reality of the problem, and we would see the beauty of God's wisdom in providing the solution. So what is the problem? Put simply, the problem is the presence and activity in the churches of false teachers. That's the problem. Look with me from verse 10. For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers, and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but both their minds and their consciences are defiled. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. The most dangerous things in our world have a Christian label. The, the most dangerous things that exist in our world have a Christian label. I remember my old pastor saying that. And it was one of those things I had to think about a bit, but he was exactly right. The, the most dangerous thing, the most dangerous people in our world are not people from other religions. They're not unbelievers. The most dangerous people in our world are people who profess to be Christians. They are the most dangerous people in our world. The most dangerous thing, the most poisonous things that exist in our world, if you were to look at the bottle, the label would read Christian. If you were to look at it, you would see there were Bible quotations all over, this, all over the place. The most dangerous things that are said in this world are things said by people who claim to be Christian teachers. There is nothing more dangerous in our world than people who profess to be Christians and yet teach and live falsely. That is the danger, that's the problem that's facing these churches. 
These teachers that Paul is talking about, these aren't guys claiming to be from another religion. They're not, they're not the guys on YouTube, you know, trying to convince you, you know, that Christianity is all terrible and false. No, these are people who claim to be Christian and they are the most dangerous people in all the world. And the danger is twofold. It's a danger that springs from firstly false doctrine and results in false living. Remember last week, Freddie introduced us to the book of Titus. And there's a really important phrase. Paul says, I'm an apostle to bring about the knowledge of the truth which accords with godliness. Truth that leads to godliness. That's what Paul was about. That's what Paul wanted Titus to be about. Well, the four teachers are doing the opposite. These four teachers, they bring about the knowledge of the lie that accords with ungodliness. In other words, they're marked by twisted truth and the disobedient, the twisted life that twisted truth produces. Right? So, so firstly, they are marked by a twisted truth. Look at me again, verse 13 to 15. This testimony is true, therefore rebuke them sharply that they may be sound in the faith, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth. To the pure, all things are pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but both their minds and their consciences are defiled. Paul gives us here a glimpse of the false truth, the twisted truth of these false teachers. And it's all about these Jewish myths and purity laws. It's classic false teaching. These were guys, these were experts trying to tell you how to get to the next spiritual level. How to level up, how to go deeper in God. And it was all to do with, you know, some background story to the Old Testament that you didn't know and, and how you shouldn't be eating this food or that food or don't touch this or maybe drink this water or drink this thing, take this cloth or whatever it is. It's all about these purity laws and it's all about these secret things. These were people who knew all the ancient Jewish traditions. They knew all the backstories to the Old Testament that weren't actually in the Bible. And so they're, they're cool with the Bible. They like the Bible. But they also have stuff that you won't hear on a Sunday. You have stuff that you might not have re recognized if you're just reading through your Bible. They have the deep things. They have secret information. And, and the only way you're going to go further in God is if you have to come to them so that they can give you this knowledge. And so rather than focusing on the gospel, they focus on these myths, these Old Testament characters, um, myths of these Old Testament characters, these purity laws, these things that had already been fulfilled in Christ. They're exactly like the people today who want to go on and tell you about how to pray to saints to get to the next level. Or they want to tell you about how actually, you know, black people are the true Jews. Or they want to tell you about, here's how you interpret your dreams. Here's the, 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 the matrix. And if you dream this, then this, and so on and so forth. That the people want to tell you how to predict the day when Jesus Christ is coming back. They are always offering you the next level Christianity. The beyond the basics Christianity. But this knowledge is not the knowledge of the truth. It sounds biblical, but it is toxic. It is twisted. It is poisonous. And we said this time and time again in the book of Colossians, but I'll say it again. The Bible says, in Christ are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are found in Christ. They're found in the gospel. But these guys have treasures of wisdom and knowledge that are found elsewhere. And it offers you maturity. But in reality, it's deadly. It's poisonous. And because it's deadly, because it's poisonous, because it's twisted, the twisted truth, the lie, produces ungodliness. And you see it in their lives. Again, we're going to start with verse 10, and then we're going to skip down to verse 16. So verse, firstly, verse 10, 10 to 12, and then we'll skip to verse 16. This is what Paul says about their lives. For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers, and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. And then skip down to verse 16. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. 
they are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. So here's the great irony. The great irony is these false teachers who are talking about purity laws and what you can't eat and what you can't touch and all those kind of stuff, and they've got all these laws and so on and so forth. The irony is their lives are marked by wickedness. Their lives are marked by impurity. And it's no surprise because purity laws can't change the heart. Trying to chase your genealogy to claim you're an Israelite doesn't change the heart. Right? Praying to the saints doesn't change the heart. Interpreting dreams doesn't change the heart. So they're talking about cleaning the outside of the cup. Meanwhile, the inside of the cup, their actual hearts, their lives are filthy. Paul says they are rebellious and deceitful. This is strong language, right? Paul gives a quote of the Cretans. Remember, this is where the church is. And these people are known for immorality. And what he says is that these false teachers, when you look at their lives, their lives are exactly like the immoral lives in the society around them. They look like the wickedness around them. Remember, Freddie said this last week, beliefs have consequences. What we believe has consequences. Truth, believing truth produces godliness. Believing lies produce ungodliness. And Paul gives example after example of their ungodliness. Notice, Paul says they are greedy. This, by the way, is a helpful clue as it comes to recognizing false teachers. Verse 11, they must be silent since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. Why do they teach for shameful gain? You know what that means? What that means is false teachers trying to get your money is not a new thing. It's not a new phenomenon. It didn't start with God TV or TBN, right? It's not, it's not new. It didn't start with these TV preachers. In fact, this has always been the case, that false teachers, they pretend that they're trying to help you, but they're trying to be helped by you, right? They pretend they're offering you something, but you're, you're actually giving to them, right? They have their eye. As they're teaching you, they have their eye on your pocket. Be, be wary of that, that preacher who's constantly telling you every five seconds about how you can support the ministry, right? Every five minutes, there's another offering. Every five minutes, there's another, here's the 25 ways you can give, right? Because as they're teaching, what they have in mind is your money. This is not new. There are today and have always been frauds dressed up as spiritual teachers. Shepherds are meant to feed you. Wolves want to feed on you, Right? That's the problem that's facing this church in Crete. And it's a massive problem. Part of the reason why Paul's language, in fact, the Bible's language is so strong, is because it's a massive problem. False teaching is destructive. There is nothing, there is no thing that is as harmful to the church as false teachers. There is nothing that has blown up churches as much as false teachers. There is nothing that sends professing Christians to hell as much as false teachers. They are wolves. I know sometimes we laugh at false teachers and, oh, isn't it so funny? Or, you know, it seems like a joke. But false teachers are wolves. Wolves do not aim to play with sheep. They aim to eat sheep. They devour sheep. Again, verse 11. They must be silent since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. When it says they're upsetting whole families, upset here doesn't mean like false teachers make you sad. That's not what it means. Upset, you know when you say you've got an upset stomach? It doesn't mean your stomach is sad. It means your stomach's upside down. It's turning upside down. You, you had that thing. You knew it was a risky thing. You had it. And now your stomach is crazy. It's turning upside down. That's what upset means here. Right? Other translations say they overthrow whole households. They turn them upside down. At its best, at its best, this kind of teaching will keep you from growing in your relationship with God. At its worst, it will send you to hell. That's what false teaching does. Because it will have you fixated on myths and genealogies and financial breakthrough and seven steps of victorious living. And meanwhile, you will live exactly like the world because those things have no power. No power at all. Meanwhile, you won't be laying hold of Christ 
And so your life will be a reflection of the ungodliness of the society around you. A society that does not know God. False teachers overthrow faith. They overthrow the faith of people who are in church. They are deadly. And if false teachers were a problem in Crete, in the time of Titus and Paul, I want to say they are far more of a problem in London in 2024. Because in, in Paul's day, you see these false teachers, right? They, they had to come into the church, right? Or they had to go into your house. They physically had to come into your house. But today is a new day for false teaching. Life is far easier for false teachers now. In fact, false teachers in Titus' day would have loved, would have fantasized about having the opportunities that false teachers today have. Because today, false teachers don't have to come and preach at your church. You don't have to physically invite them into your home. All you have to do is turn on the TV. All you have to do is put your phone on. All you have to do is listen to that podcast. All you have to do is get that WhatsApp video forward. All you have to do is go into YouTube or TikTok. And that, you know, all you have to do is find out about that new man of God, that new Christian influencers. And they have your ears and they can poison you for millions of miles away. False teachers now, they can turn your life upside down from their living rooms. And they can destroy your faith. Look, church, as, as one of your elders, let me, let me plead with you. Please think, please, please think about the Christian content you are consuming. Some of you think, oh, it's, it's Christian. So the most dangerous things in this world are things that, that on the label say Christian. Some of you think you're taking medicine, you're drinking in poison. And it will overthrow your faith. And look, it's no help to say, you know, how could you say, how could you call someone a false teacher? Jesus says there are false teachers. Paul says there are false teachers. We are not nicer than God. We are not wiser than God. There are false, there are people who are pastors, man, men of God, whatever, call it what you want, influencers, whatever it is, that if you listen to what they teach, it will send you to hell. They are dangerous. They are deadly. And this is why Paul had to leave Titus in Crete. Because if this problem was left unchecked, it would destroy the church. And it's the kind of problem that if we leave it unchecked, it would destroy this church. That's the problem. The problem is these false teachers. But what's the solution? What is God's solution to this? So look at me first at verse 5. This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and... Appoint elders in every town as I directed you. So pause. We're going to talk more about this, but pause. Here's the main thing to say. God's solution to the problem of these false teachers is elders. It's really striking. The solution isn't just read the Bible more or be more discerning or make sure you're a part of the church. No, the solution is elders. Reading the Bible more is a part of it. Being discerning is a part of it. Being part of the church is a part of it. But none of those solutions are complete. You need elders. Paul says, these false teachers are coming. But he doesn't say, look, Titus, I left you in Crete to tell them to read their Bible so that they can discern false teachers. That's true enough. But an essential part of God's solution is, Titus, if you want to deal with this problem, you need to appoint elders. Elders are an essential part of God's solution to the problem of false teachers. And then second, we're going to see why elders are so critical to this solution. And yet, while we're here on this issue that elders are God's solution to this problem, let me speak briefly to those of you here who are not members of this church or, in fact, of any church. Those of you who are not part of this church you're not members, and you're not members or part of another church, you do not have elders. You do not have elders. Membership is the process by which people come under the elders of the church. Membership is the process by which you say these, what, there's many things that happen in membership, but one of the things is you're saying these are the elders to whom God has called me to submit. That's what happens when you join a church. And so visiting and visiting time and time again doesn't mean that you have elders. Right? To have elders, you need to actually join the church. And 
the reason why I'm saying that is because elders are God's solution to this issue. And it is foolish not to follow God's plan for the church. Look, I know some of us, maybe you're in the process of becoming members, right? Or maybe, you know, you're, you just come in and you're, 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 you know, you're, you're discerning how you're going to join this church, right? Or some of you, again, you're, you're members of another church. But joining the church is the way you come under elders. And a consistent refusal to join a church is a consistent refusal to have elders. And let me be very clear, it does not have to be this church. It doesn't have to be this church. There are many churches, but you need elders. And if you think you don't need elders, you think you are wiser than God. You think you know better than God. This is God's solution. Every single Christian needs elders because God's idea, this is, elders are not, it's not things that church, elders are God's idea. They're God's solution to the problem of false teachers. Okay, so elders are essential, but why is it? How is it that elders help to deal with the problem of false teachers? Simply by teaching the knowledge of the truth that accords with godliness. In other words, elders are the solution because when you have elders, faithful elders that teach the truth and whose lives are marked by the godliness that that truth produces, that is a safeguard against false teachers. Right? So in the same way false teachers, they, have, they teach false doctrine and it leads to false lives, God's solution is elders that teach true, true doctrine, faithful doctrine, sound doctrine, and whose lives are marked by the godliness that that doctrine produces. So firstly then, elders must be those who teach the knowledge of the truth. Look with me at verse 9. He, that's the elder, must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. Elders teach sound doctrine. That word sound means healthy, right? You just say someone's sound in body and mind, it means they're healthy in body and mind. Elders teach healthy doctrine. It's not twisted, it's not deficient. It's whole. And those who take it, it makes you healthy. It's opposite to the poison of the false teachers. And notice that this teaching, this, what the, the job that God gives elders to do, is positively there to teach the truth, to encourage people, but also they are to rebuke those who contradict. In other words, an elder has to say, this is the truth, believe it. But an elder must also be able to say, this is not the truth, run from it. Both of those things are part of the teaching of the elder. So, so it's one thing to say this is the truth and to encourage people in it, but the elder must also be able to recognize, actually, that sounds like the truth, but it's not the truth. That's a lie. And to warn the church to flee from it. Elders have to do both in their teaching. Sometimes that means elders call false teachers by name, as Paul does. Sometimes they, they, they call names. But elders must warn and must rebuke when there is false teaching. The elder must be able to teach the truth and refute error. And I think when it comes to elders, we often highlight the importance of the character of the elder. And we ought to. I think that's the biblical emphasis. But I do think we run the risk of underemphasizing the importance of teaching for the elder. The elder must be able to encourage to teach the truth and refute error. There is a giftedness that is necessary to the work of the elder. And if we ignore that, we ignore that to our own peril. A shepherd that can't recognize wolves and doesn't point out those are wolves and doesn't warn those are wolves is either a shepherd that does not love the sheep or is simply someone who is incapable of being a shepherd. Character is vital, it's absolutely vital. We're going to end there, it's vital, it's essential. But character, without being able to teach, still leaves you unqualified and unsuitable for this task. Elders that do not teach and do not warn are not part of God's solution to this problem. There are always going to be false teachers. There's always going to be false teaching. And God's solution is elders that know how to teach the truth and expose error. Don't hear me as saying that means every elder must preach. That's not what this is saying. But every elder must be able to teach. 
and to be able to refute false doctrine because this is an essential part of elders being God's safeguard to the church. The first part of elders as the solution is their teaching. And yet all of that teaching is useless, worse than useless, if that teaching does not accord with godliness in the life of the elder. That's the emphasis in the qualification. Look at me again from verse 5. This is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife, and his children are believers and are not open to charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, and disciplined. The, the character qualifications of the elders are the opposite of what Paul says is true of the false teachers. And it's all really summarized in that first qualification. The elder must be above reproach. So in a society like Crete, which is very similar to a society like London, known for dishonesty, recklessness, violence, sexual immorality, the elders were to be different. They were to be godly. And it's a godliness that begins firstly with how they interact with their family. They must be faithful to their wives. They must be faithful to raise their children with godly discipline. There's a footnote in your Bibles, right, on verse 5. There's a footnote. In the footnote, it says, I, it's either saying children are believers or children are faithful. And I think the footnote is correct, right? This is talking about faithful children. His children must be faithful. And if you want to know what that means, it tells us what that means. They must not be marked by debauchery or insubordination. In other words, when you look at the lives of his children, you should see that it should evidence a man that leads his home well that cares for his household well. These four teachers are marked by disorder. But the, person who, the man who would be an elder must be a man who leads his home with order. And look, I, I don't think this means that an elder must have multiple children or even that the elder must be married, right? Paul himself is single and he serves as a leader in God's church. But what it does tell us is that the best comparison for the work of the elder is the work of a husband and a father. And the best way you could see it is actually what, what you see a man in his home, that's the best comparison you could have for what a man would be as an elder. And if a man isn't married and a man doesn't have children, then there are other things you need to look at. But again, the elder must be someone in his private life, in his family home, he must be marked by righteousness. And it's not just true about how he leads his family, it's about how he leads his own self. He must be marked by discipline and the fear of God. False teachers are marked by looking for money. Paul says the elders must be someone who is not greedy for gain. Elders are brutal. He talks about them being like animals. The elder that must be gentle and upright. In other words, the elder must be a picture of the godliness that the truth produces. It's not saying that the elder must be perfect. If you're looking for perfect elders, you, you will not appoint any elders. But when you look at his life, there must be a soundness to it, a healthiness to it. You can't say it and say, oh, you know what, he's great in lots of it, but man, there, he's just really ungodly in that. He must be an example of the Christian life. He must not live in such a way that would suggest that he does not actually live by the things that he teaches. And if there's an area of his life that's marked by ungodliness, he cannot be an elder because such an elder is not God's solution to the problem of false teachers. In short, it is essential for the elder that his sound teaching is married to a sound life. And so elders who proclaim truth and yet live a double life destroy the church. They destroy the church. And they destroy the church because what they suggest is there is a disconnect between truth and the godliness that truth produces. By their lives, they actually preach a lie. The lie is that you can know God and yet be unaffected by that knowledge. And that is a lie. And that is a lie that is wreaking havoc in the church. It's a lie that wreaks havoc to the Christian witness. It's a lie, right, that means that such elders, those who even teach the truth and yet live a double life, 
such elders are partners with the false teachers. They are accomplices to those false teachers, as those false teachers aim to destroy the church. And that's why, again and again, the, the Bible says we must not only hear the word or even teach the word, we must do the word. It cannot be a church that knows so much, and yet, as you look in our lives, we live no different to the world. That is to tell a lie about the gospel. That is to tell a lie about God. It destroys the church. Believing the truth makes you godly. It makes you a people devoted to good works. And so, church, let me warn us. By God's grace, I believe we are a church that cares a lot about the truth. I think we care a lot about the knowledge of the truth. I think we care a lot about that the Bible is taught faithfully. But hear this, right? The, the consistency of the life of the elder being married to the truth he proclaimed. The reason why that's so important is because elders are examples to the church. And so it is vital for the church not to be those who profess to know the truth and yet by our lives deny God. We cannot be people who boast that we know this and that and, oh, this is what we know and actually, you know, that's not what the Bible says and let me teach you how to interpret this. And yet, all that knowledge is not leading to godliness. When that happens, we ought not to boast, we ought to fear because it is a lie that we can believe the truth and it have no impact on our godliness. It's a lie that we can know the gospel and it not actually change the way we live. It's true, you could know maybe science or you could know history and, you know, it might not affect how you live, but you cannot know the living God. You cannot know this God, the God who cannot lie, and be unaffected by that truth. Knowing God is knowing a person, it's knowing God. And so any claim to the knowledge of the truth in any of our lives that is not married with, that is not in accordance with godliness is satanic. It's Satan that quotes scripture and yet does not know God. That's the knowledge of Satan. That's the knowledge of demons. That's what James says. You, you claim that you know God is one. Even the demons know that. That kind of knowledge will do you no good. That kind of knowledge, all it will do is it will make you more accountable on the day you stand before the God you claim to know. Every time we open our Bibles... Every time we hear God's word, we ought to plead with God that he changes us because the knowledge of the truth accords with godliness. And elders, part of the reason God appoint, tells us to appoint elders is because elders are meant to be an example to all of us that truth leads to godliness. And church, when that happens, when you have churches that have elders that teach the truth and live the truth, they set an example to the church. And when the church follows that, that is beautiful. When you have a people of God who are speaking the truth and living the truth, that is beautiful. And it is so beautiful that it is, it is a safeguard against false teachers. It's a safeguard against all kind of false teaching. When, when elders give that example and when people follow that example, we demonstrate the truth that God actually changes us. We demonstrate the truth that the church is not like the world. Cretans may be this and that and that, and Londoners may be this and that and that, but the church of the living God is like this. It's marked by godliness because we are people of the truth. We demonstrate the power of the gospel. That's the beauty of the local church, that in a world full of immorality, the church proclaims the truth and then lives the truth. The problem here in Titus 1, 5 to 16 is false teachers. The solution is elders. And as we close, I want to leave us with just four things practically to take away from this. And there are four things that all flow out of our need for faithful elders as God's solution to the problem. And the first thing is this. Take seriously the privilege of appointing elders. Paul said the churches need elders, and so Titus was to appoint elders. The reason why we appoint elders is because the church needs elders elders. If you're part of this church, we as a congregation have a role in appointing elders. Next month, particularly, we are going to vote on elders. So prayerfully engage in this. 
because the issue of eldership has everything to do with our spiritual safety and well-being. Take it seriously. We are not above false teaching. We are not above being swept away with false doctrine. This, these churches in Crete, they just had Paul. Paul was just with them. And yet now there's false teachers just rampant. We're not above that. It's a great danger to the church, every single church. And essential to God's solution is appointing elders. Paul says to Titus, go find men whose lives look like this, men who can teach like this. And Paul assumes that he will find that. And we likewise have a responsibility of appointing elders. All right, our next meeting, we're going to vote on potential elders. And you know, here's the thing about voting, right? I, I, I sometimes think when, when we vote on stuff, we think, ah, yes, this is my time to get my preferences through. Or this is my time to shape things in the way that I want. Let me be clear. Votes on elders, eldership have nothing to do with your preference. Zero. Have nothing to do with who you like or do not like. We vote according to the scripture. Every time, not just this time, but every time, we vote on elders. The, the question before us is very simple. Are the men before us the men described in Titus 1? If they are, we appoint them because they are part of God's solution to the problem of false teaching. If they are not, we do not appoint them. We do not vote for them because they will be part of the problem rather than being part of the solution. When we approach a time like this, we pray for God's wisdom to find people, men whose lives are marked by the ability to teach the truth and to then live that truth. And as we appoint them, we trust that God will use his solution to guard us against the problem of false teaching. So the first thing is we need to take seriously the responsibility of appointing elders. But then secondly, as we appoint elders, make use of your elders. And in particular here, Titus 1, make use of your elders as you think about the danger of false teachers. Very specifically, speak to your elders, chat to us, message us about the Christian content you are listening to. Really simple, but really clear application. Make use of your elders as you discern teaching. Because elders are God's solution to the problem of false teaching in the church. Some of you guys, some of these guys, right, in, in Crete, they were inviting people into their home. They thought it was all good. And yet these guys were overthrowing their faith. Elders is God's solution. And I know some of us just sat there thinking, you know what, that's, that's cool for the other people out there. I, I know what good teaching is. I know a false teacher, you know, from a mile away, you know. Um, I, I know how to discern. I'm so discerning. Don't be wiser than God. Don't be wiser than God. Ultimately, God's solution isn't just be more discerning. God's solution is elders. Make use of your elders. Don't be so self-sufficient that you miss God's design. This is God's design. It's beautiful. Make use of your elders. Thirdly, pray, pray for your elders. Pray that the elders that are appointed and that hopefully you're making use of, pray that God keeps them such that their qualifications of their life are things that mark their entire time as elders. These qualifications, they're not just qualifications for entry, right? They're qualifications for the role. You know, sometimes, in order to get a job or get a role or to, to do something, you need to learn certain stuff or you need to get to a certain qualification. But once you're in it, it doesn't matter, right? You know, like, if you want to, you come here, you want to be a British citizen, you have to take the, um, the test, right? There's a British citizenship test. And they ask you the most random questions, I was looking it up. The first question that came up was, which king was executed in 1649? And if you want to be a citizen, you move here, you want to be a citizen, you need to know that kind of stuff. You need to study that. But here's the thing. Once you pass the test, they give you a citizenship. Who cares? <laughs> right? Who cares who was executed in 1649? I'm in. Like, it, it doesn't matter, right? But being an elder isn't like that. You have to be qualified to get in, and you have to be qualified to stay in. It's like your, your surgeon. You want to know that your surgeon was good enough 20 years ago, was qualified enough to pass the test. But even more important, you want to know that today they're qualified, and they know what they're doing with surgery. The characteristics that Paul speaks about given to Titus are things that have to continue 
to characterize elders. Elders must be above reproach to get in, they must be above reproach to stay in, and so pray for your elders. Pray that God would cause them to continue to be faithful. Pray that God would cause them to be continual examples of what it is, not just to proclaim the truth, but to live the truth. And then lastly, we need to take seriously our, our responsibility to appoint elders. We need to make use of our elders. We need to be praying for those elders. But lastly, let's follow the example of elders, faithful elders, by holding on to the knowledge of the truth. Hold on to the knowledge of the truth. And as we close here, I don't want you to be uninformed about the truth that Paul is speaking about. When he says the knowledge of the truth that leads to godliness, I don't want you to leave here not being sure about that. We're going to talk about that in the next few weeks, but we can't even wait that long. I want you to see what that truth is. The truth that Paul is talking about is not a set of laws of morality or do's and don'ts. That's not the truth that ultimately leads to godliness. No, when Paul is speaking about the truth, Paul is speaking about the gospel. It's the gospel that elders must teach. Because it's the gospel that transforms us. It's the gospel that transforms the life of an elder, and it's the gospel that transforms the life of the church. It's not a mere command, it's the gospel. It's the gospel that makes a man hospitable. It's the gospel that makes a man gentle. It's the gospel that makes a man faithful in his home. It's the gospel that makes a man self-controlled. It's the gospel. It's as we tell ourselves the old story of what God did in giving us Jesus, and how Jesus secured for us eternal life, and how we died for our sins, that is how we become a people who are above reproach. It's not through more techniques and gimmicks and stuff like that. That's not how we live the godly life. It's through the gospel. And if you're not trusting in Jesus Christ, that's what you need. Not more laws, not more self-help. You need the gospel, the good news of how God so loved you that he gave his son for you. And it's that gospel that will change you. Because that gospel is so beautiful. The truth of God's love is so beautiful. And in fact, it's so beautiful that it actually transforms you and changes you so that you become like the beautiful God that the gospel is speaking of. That's how beautiful the gospel is. You know, the big problem with false teaching isn't how wrong it is. The big problem with false teaching isn't how big the errors are. The big problem with false teaching is that it distracts you from the gospel. And the gospel is so beautiful. And the gospel has power. And the gospel changes us, not from the outside, but it changes us from the inside out. And so my prayer is, if you don't know the gospel, my prayer is that you would go out believing the gospel. And if you are someone here, you are trusting in Jesus Christ. You know what it is to sing, to rejoice about the love that God has for you. Don't ever let anyone distract you from that. Don't ever get veered away from that. Don't ever think the secret to the Christian life, the deeper life, the next level, is this person or that person. Fix your eyes on Jesus Christ. Fix your eyes on the God who cannot lie, who has promised you a hope that is kept in heaven for you. Fix your eyes on him because when you do so, that gospel will change you and it will make you like our beautiful God, God our Savior and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you. We thank you for your church. We thank you that you love the church. We thank you that you so love the church that you gave your son for the church. Not that we were anything in ourselves, but in your great love, you set your love on us. Lord, we pray that you would forgive us for ways, even subtle ways, where we have been distracted from the gospel where we have followed the wor words of clever people who use the Bible and speak the Bible and yet are taking our eyes away from Jesus Christ. Lord, would you forgive us where we have been so worldly, thinking about the things of this world rather than thinking about your glory and your kingdom. Lord, I pray that we would be a people fixated on the gospel and that, Lord, I pray for us as a church, Stockwell Baptist Church, Lord, as long as your son Jesus Christ would tarry, that you would preserve this church. I pray, Lord, that you would preserve this church. I pray, Lord, that this church would be a church that appoints faithful elder after faithful elder after faithful elder. And I pray, Lord, that a faithful eldership will be part of your means of preserving this church. Lord, we see example after example of churches that were once faithful, gone far astray. We don't want to trust in ourselves. Lord, would you help us? Would you help us, Lord, to take seriously what your word says? 
Would you help us, Lord, to be people that love the truth and live that truth out so that our lives would be a wonderful testimony of the gospel? We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.